Keep yourself in the loop of everything football on the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The latest news on and off the field, be it college football, Big Ten, SCC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, to the NFL. We've got you covered. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. Back to the GSMC Football Podcast, right here in the GSMC Podcast Network. This is your host, Price Lewis, back again to talk about everything football related here today. We have another great show for you today. You know, I gotta give some love to the NFC East, man. Big weekend for them. Not from the bottom two, but from the top two teams, which is looking like one of the most interesting races and all of the NFL for that division title and that fourth seed in that home playoff game. You know, because they had a big weekend. They upset it. some big-time teams this week, and I'm going to talk about both of those teams. Also talk about the dissension and and, and, and and big news, you know, with Philadelphia, obviously, and then obviously we have to talk about the Cowboys. You know, I'm going to give my Week 14 predictions. You know what I do here. I give my Week 14 predictions, talk about everything football-related, NFL-related from there, talk about each game, my reasons why somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose, you know, those things. And then after that in this show, we're also going to talk about the biggest college games of the weekend. And also, we're going to get into some Pittsburgh Steelers talk as well because of the fact that they did end up not being an undefeated team anymore. So we got to talk about that moving forward and potential other NFL news. So, let's go ahead and get into it. So... I'm going to start with the New York Giants. Because, you know, like I said, I got to give the NFC East some love. The New York Giants, a team that started, I believe they started 1-6, and 1-5. Looked like they were about to be probably the worst team, if not the worst te- one of the worst teams in the NFL. Daniel Jones was turning the ball over. The defense was still trying to come in together. You know, because they do run that New England t- style of defense, which is one of the most complex defenses to run. They lost Shaquan Barkley. You know, they didn't have Odell. You know, since they traded him away to Cleveland about a year ago. And so it looked like, okay, clearly rebuilding process. We don't know a lot about Joe Judge. You know, like, okay. And now look at them. Five and seven. Tight for first. Current. Tight for first, actually a first place team because people forget they actually swept the Washington football team this year. So they're first in the division, have the tiebreaker on them, playing some of their best football, coming off a fantastic victory over the Seattle Seahawks where they basically just dominated up front. If there's one thing about both Washington and New York, What is one thing this league has shifted to that people feel like if you have this, you have a chance? D-line play, getting after the passer, getting after the quarterback. And that's what both teams can do. People don't realize, or don't think about this move a lot. But remember, a lot of people question Dave Gettleman. They question his decisions. They question why did he do what he did. One move that I think a lot of people liked but still was underrated was when he traded for Leonard Williams, who people forget in New York... With the Jets, Leonard Williams was considered a top D lineman in the league. Like, he's a very good player. He was drafted high, and he's lived up to his expectations. But people, because the New York Jets were bad, nobody cared. Because remember, the Jets, during the times of all these years, they always had D lines. They Remember, they had Muhammad Wilkinson. They had uh, Leonard Williams. They had a lot of talent up front. The issue was they didn't have much of anything else, but New York Jets those previous those years usually had decent defenses. They just offensively were, were struggling because their D-line was good. So he made that move. He is now instantly one of the best, if not the best, defensive linemen that they have. They have other guys up front that can get after the passer, which is the contributing reason why they're able to be competitive in games. They were able to take advantage of Seattle's defensive line for that particular reason. 
Russell did not have time to throw all day. He struggled to, to, to find guys. They ran a complex scheme zone defense on Sunday against Seattle, and that's what really slowed Seattle down. They have got they have some guys. Listen, you may sit here and say the secondary is not the best, but they have a decent, they have a good enough secondary. Jabril Pre- uh, Jabril Peppers, Bradbury, those guys. They got talent. They just needed, obviously, I feel like with the COVID thing, not getting a lot of time running that New England style of defense, it was going to take some games for them to really get it down, but they have defensive talent. They have clearly a good defensive coordinator, and that's why they're able to be competitive in the game. did in this. Daniel Jones was hurt this past game, but Colt McCoy did what he needed to do to win. And they were actually able to find a very successful running game this week. Wayne Gallman ran the ball great. Alfred Morris, a lot of people forgot about Alfred Morris. He turned back the hands of time, too. They found a running back duo that is that is that is capable while Saquon is out for the year. Daniel Jones is looked to be, based off what Joe Judge has said, looks like he is optimistic that he'll be able to play on Monday. I mean, play Sunday. And like I said, Daniel Jones before that hadn't turned the ball over in the two previous games he played, which was one of the things that was plaguing him. It was he turned the ball over too much. So the Giants have gotten better week after week to a point where now they're a team that, listen, I know it still may seem like a stretch, but depending on the matchup, they may be able to beat a playoff team that has a way better record than them. Because remember, they're going to play the fifth seed. That means they're playing the highest rated wild card by record team. Which, which I mean, you would think, okay, probably is going to be a pretty decent team. Especially with it, with, with, you know, maybe somebody like the Rams potentially. They could play Seattle again. They could play Tampa Bay. And remember, they almost beat Tampa Bay on Monday by football. Some people say they should have won that game. So... With them getting better too, the Giants are going to be a team to be reckoned with. And then we got to talk about the Washington football team. The Washington football team, again, one thing they have that helps them is that they have one of the better defensive lines. They have guys. They have Chase Young, Jonathan Allen. You know, they got guys up front. You know, they can get after you, and then, you know, they had issues at the quarterback position to start the year, and they kind of, they kind of got it solved, like, I mean, if we're, if you're being honest here, the reason why we, we never knew, because he was coming back from the injury, but Alex Smith, before the injury, if you looked at the quarterbacks they had on the roster, was the best quarterback, but we just didn't know, coming back from an injury like that, what would Alex Smith be, Alex Smith looks like the Alex Smith vote to me. And if he's the Alex Smith, oh, he's better than Dwayne Haskins and Kyle Allen. So now they have their best starting quarterback, which Alex Smith is not a bad, he's not a guy who's like, oh, he's okay. Alex Smith has won 13, 12 games a year. He's made it to AFC, NFC championship, I mean, NFC championship games before. Alex Smith can play with the best of them. And now you have him being your guy. You got Terry McLaughlin. Who are make Terry McLaurin, who is an underrated wide receiver, but a good wide receiver. You got Logan Thomas, a former Virginia Tech quarterback, shifted the tight end. He's balling out at that position. Remember, they they let go of Jordan Reed because of his injuries. And they said, hey, we need you to play tight end. And it's been a great. They have multiple running backs. Antonio Gibson. And, you know, the other guys are slipping my head right now, but there's another guy. I want to say, I don't know if it was, I think it's McKissick too. I think they also, I don't know if that, I think it's McKissick because I think he's a guy they use as a receiving back mainly, but he's explosive. And, and, and it fits what Alex Smith does, which we know Alex Smith is more of a, what people consider a check down, dink and dunk kind of guy. And then, like I said, they have, they're able to run the football. So now you can run the football and you have a good D-line. Alex Smith is an efficient quarterback that doesn't turn the ball over. 
listen, I think the Washington football team's secondary is very suspect to me. I think they can be had. They're not the best in the back end, but that's why you count that defensive line to get home. And they went into Pittsburgh and beat a Steeler team that was undefeated, and they beat them at their place. They were trailing in the fourth quarter and came all the way back to win. And so we got to give credit where credit is due. Now, I look at their remaining schedules. Washington, to me, has the best chance to win division off schedules because they play a lot of teams that are around their talent level, around their record. Like the 49ers are fine, they play the Giants, um, I believe. Or maybe that's the Cowboys. I I think they pl- they play they play the Eagles. I know that they're playing a lot of teams that are not significantly better than them. They're playing a lot of teams that are around their level. Now the Cowboys, if you look at the end of their schedule, since some people like talk about them still making a run, they have the weakest. They have the probably the easiest group of teams. They they still got to play teams within the division. They played the Giants in the last week of the season. I think that's L. And they could in the way they play, they could lose to any of the other teams too. Because the Giants have the toughest schedule out of all of them, but listen, I think they're going to be competitive. I think they're going to be—it's going to be close. I think they're going to be battling, and it could come down to some late matchups. Because, like I said, the Giants have the tiebreaker on the football team, so all they got to do is just have the same record and they're in. Washington actually has to have a better record, so they got to hope. Wash maybe the Giants finish one and three down the stretch. They could maybe finish 2-2, two and two, which I feel like is very possible with the schedule. They beat the San Francisco this week. They're going to have a good chance. But listen, the Giants also play Arizona this week. And the way Arizona's playing, that could be a win. And now they're going to be 6-7 next week. And it's like three games left. And it's just like, who's going to NFC East? The Giants are the, way, are, 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 are the football team. Because basically at this point, you look at Philadelphia, Jalen Hurts is starting this week. We don't know how that's going to look. They have a huge issue at quarterback, but I don't think they're going to be able to get back in it. Basically, if they lose this week and the other two teams win, they're pretty much out of it, officially. And then, the only the only way they could get it is that they would have to win the last three games of you're the Eagles. And that they have to hope the Giants have a better record than Washington but then they can tie Washington because they have the tiebreaker on Washington. And then the Cowboys, we don't even get me started on the Cowboys. Cowboys are just, are, are, I just, the way they come off to me, I just don't see it. I, I don't, I don't see it at all. I think they're going to sit here and they're going to lose. And so the NFC East to me is a two team race. The other two teams have, Falling off, they're having a look into next year, hoping to build. But I wouldn't be surprised, in my honest opinion, if the Washington football team and the New York Giants are the face of this division for the next couple of years because they have good young coach. They have good coaches. Listen, they'll, they the only thing that could be relevant is the quarterback situation. If Daniel Jones improves, they got their guy. The Giants will be there for a while. Washington. We'll have to see what they do. I'm sure Alex Smith isn't a long-term accident, and they don't probably believe in Dwayne Haskins. So they're going to have to still find a guy to be the guy. But one thing about Riverboat Ron, I think he's not afraid to stick with Alex Smith for a couple more years if he gives him the best chance to win. With that D-line, knowing they don't have to pay Alex Smith a lot of money too, I think they'll be good to go. And so it's going to be interesting to see how it ends for them, and we'll have to just see how everything works out. But that's all the time we have here for this segment. Coming up next, we're going to get into my Week 14 predictions. So stay tuned right here on the GSMC Basketball Podcast. All 
Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy dash football dash podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last Sunday. We discussed the NFC East. We discussed the success that the Giants and the Washington football team have had as they have now preceded themselves to the top of the NFC East, playing some great football, coming off big wins over, over some of the NFL's best that we've had this past week. Now looking more at more of a serious team that you may have to take serious into that home playoff game. It may not be that easy game that everybody thought it would be. So, to me, we're going to have to keep an eye on it, see what happens with it, and, you know, we'll, we'll see how things end up. But before I get into my Week 14 predictions, I would like to remind you guys, please don't forget to follow us at GSMC on Twitter at GSMC underscore back football. It is GSMC underscore football. Follow us there, interact with us, talk about everything related in the entire spectrum of football we love interacting and talking to you guys, so don't forget to check that out. But now we're going to get into my week 14 predictions. Starting with the Broncos and the Panthers. Both teams, you know, 4-8, and eight, season's over. But playing for next year, Panthers, I feel like, as a lot of people have said, are probably one of the better bad teams. They look like they have the potential to make that jump next year. They just add a couple more things. They get better on defense. The guys who they drafted improve. They look like a team that could be a very good team in the NFC South next year. Teddy Bridgewater has had a good season. He's done exactly what I'm sure they expected him to do. Hopefully Christian McCaffrey has a healthier season. Remember, Christian McCaffrey's been hurt most of this year. Which, I mean, obviously injuries have been a big deal in the NFL this year because of the COVID protocols and everything. So they have, you know, their 3.5 favorite in this game. I think they'll be good to go. Now, Denver is a team that is going to have to make another big decision this offseason. From the indications it looks like is that Drew Locke is struggling and it doesn't seem that he's the guy after the way he ended the last year. John Elway has to make a decision on, is he going to try to stick it out another year at Drew Locke? Is he hoping, okay, what if we had a normal offseason? If they're, if they're able to do that, would he be better? You know, cause, but, it, but from what you're seeing is that he's making a lot of mistakes. Some people feel like he's kind of being like Baker Mayfield, kind of thinks he's better than what he was, isn't humble, thinks he can make all the throws, and now he's putting unnecessary throws out there, getting picked off and costing his team. I mean, I don't know if you heard, but Jerry Judy had a tweet that he deleted basically saying, oh, well, at least I got my conditioning in. So clearly that could be a shot at him. But in this game, I think the Panthers right now are playing better. I think Denver obviously has a defense that's going to keep them in the game. Their defense has been still good, really, without Vaughn Miller the entire year and all the injuries they've had. Jarrell Casey, they have still been very good, competitive, and they've played well. It's just more about the offense struggling. And so I think this is going to be a close game. But I think the Panthers are going to be able to make enough plays late to win the game. And I think they're going to beat uh, Denver this week. In the next game, we have Giants and Cardinals. Obviously, I just came off a segment talking about how great the Giants have been. And now, listen. The key to this game, to me, is Kyler Murray. He has not been himself since injuring his AC joint. He, they don't run the ball with him anymore. I, I That Patriot game was the first game that kind of made me realize that because they, 
just just the way they played. They play conservative now to me. They play like they're scared to put Kyler in harm's way. And if he's really that hurt, then, then I mean, maybe you shouldn't play him. To me, because... What's the point of limiting your offense where you can't even use the threat of the Kyler Murray run because you're scared he's going to injure his, his his shoulder worse? Then, you know, he doesn't seem like he has the same zip, the same explosive. I see, I feel like a lot of throws are short for him. It just feels like he can't be Kyler Murray that we saw at the beginning of the year. And that is what's affecting them. Because of the, because when, when Kyler Murray was special, their offense became so unpredictable. It became like you got to guard so many different things. Like, oh, it it was hard to keep the Cardinals down. Even if they struggled early, they could bounce back late and still put up 20-25 in the second half. Now it's like they're struggling to score points. Kyler is is struggling to score points. He's struggling to be himself. He's struggling to to make plays. DeAndre Hopkins, we've talked about how he sometimes feels like he's not getting the ball enough. Why am I not getting enough throws in my direction? If if Kyler Murray cannot be Kyler Murray, I don't think they can win this game. And I think the Giants, with that D-line, are going to be all over Kyler Murray all day. And so you know Cliff Kingsbury is going to try to have a short passing game and try to run the football, which I feel like they're not a power running team, but I feel like they've tried to have to be that because of the fact that they don't want to put Kyler Murray in harm's way. Hopefully Kingsbury can come up with something that works a little better because they need it. Because listen, their defense was never that great to begin with. Now, as much as we say their defense isn't good, they, they're only 14th in the league in points allowed. So they're in the middle of the pack, which I think that's where their defense is, a middle of the pack defense. But you're going against a team, the Giants, who don't score a lot of points, but the way the Cardinals have been playing recently, it may not be a high-scoring game. It could be a 20-24 game. And with that deep line, and if they have, and if the Giants still have the Saints because running the ball and Daniel Jones gets back, I mean, the Cardinals are 2.5 favorites here. But I may have to go with the flat out upset here and, and go with the Giants to win because the Cardinals need this game. They're 6 and 6 and on the verge of now being under 500 after just being 6 and 2 four weeks ago. Firmly in the playoff pitcher, firmly in the division pitcher, and now they're in danger of not even making the playoffs. They need this game. But the Giants also know they need this game when they've been playing about like it. And so I'm going to go with the Giants here to pick up the win. I think they're going to get the upset because I, I just don't think the Cardinals are going to be the team that we've seen. That was great. Now we have Dallas and the Bengals. And, I mean, this is a game to me the Cowboys should win. I mean, you're going against a team who doesn't have a quarterback. If Joe Burrow was playing in this game, I would go with Cincinnati. In all my honest opinion, I would go with I would go with Cincinnati if Joe Burrow was playing in this game. But he's not. And the Bengals have not had good quarterback play from Brandon Allen, or good enough quarterback play, I'll say, to win. Even against the Dallas Cowboys, I think their defense is going to play well enough. I think Andy Dalton's a more capable quarterback than Brandon Allen. Because I feel like they're basically the same team but a more capable quarterback on one side. So they should be 3.5 favorites in this game. They should beat Cincinnati in this game. There should be no ex- if they lose. I mean, if I'm I, I mean, listen, we already say they've already lost some inexplicable games. They lose this game, it's like, dude, you're losing to one of the worst teams in football, if not the worst team in football to some people. I've heard analysts and radio people say some people think the Jets, the way they've been playing recently, could beat the Cowboys right now. So, the Cowboys need to win this game just to to quiet all that talk. But I expect them to beat the Bengals. But if they don't, you're just going to have more questions around Big D. And I'm sure they don't want that. And then next, we have Houston and the Bears. The Bears, man, they really fell off. They they were in prime. The thing, the craziest thing about their downfall is since they started so well, they were still very firmly in the wild card picture. They're still in the wild card picture now. They had to lead on Detroit. They could have won the game. I think if they won the game, they would have actually slid into the wild card spot, and they would have actually still been in the playoffs. And then they lost in the last minutes. 
it, 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 they're just falling apart, man. They're falling apart. They didn't even have a bad game offense, but they had 30 points. <laughs> and they just couldn't close the deal. I have Chicago Bear friends who were just like, we. Did, they after that loss last week, they were calling for the whole team to be gone. Because how do you lose a game like that in Detroit? Now you got Houston, who's playing some of their best football right now. Even though they came off a loss last week, they're playing better than they played early in the season. You know what Deshaun Watson can do. They can definitely beat Chicago. They're one point favorites because that's how close it is. But if I'm if I'm Houston, I would come into this game expecting to win, and that's what I expect. I think Houston's going to win the game. I think Houston's going to come in there. They're going to do what they want to do. Deshaun's going to have a Deshaun Watson type of game, and they're going to beat Chicago. Then we have Titans and Jags. Titans, honestly, I expect this game to be a blowout. I expect the Titans to be mad about what happened last week after getting shot by Cleveland. I expect Tannehill to have a big game. A.J. Brown, Derrick Henry, they're going to go back to what they... It, it's funny because it feels like Tennessee's gone through these periods where they'll play really well and then they'll have that one bad loss. Like, they had that bad loss to Cincinnati earlier this year. Then. And then they started like a three-game losing streak, and then they bounced back, won a couple of games playing tennis. They literally just came off their best win against the Colts the week previously. Then come out and lay that stinker against Cleveland. Now you got the Jags coming to town. I think this is going to be another bounce-back game. And what this might raise the question of with Tennessee is just, is Tennessee consistent enough? Because it seems like a lot of their issues are dealing with inconsistency. But I think they'll be able to come out and beat the Jags this week. And then, the big game of the 1 o'clock games. We got the Kansas City Chiefs and the Miami Dolphins. Chiefs are 7-point favorites. Chiefs are 11-1. Offensively, we know how great they are. They make plays defensively. But Chicago, but, but Miami is a team that a lot of people look at as a, as, a, as a dark horse. You have the young quarterback in Tua, who has played well for what they've asked him to do. You have Brian Flores, a guy who people feel like coach of the year candidate, has has really gotten this team turned around. Defensively, one of the best defenses in the league. Only allowing 17.7 points a game, basically 18 points a game. You know, they, they, they do what they got to do. Now, the big question this game is going to be, and I'm sure the big matchup everybody's going to be looking at is the Miami defense versus that Kansas City offense. This is one of the few matchups where I think Miami might have enough secondary players to match up. The key to me is going to be Travis Kelsey versus Miami's linebackers. You know, you know, Roberts and, and Van Noy and Jerome Baker, they're going to have a tough matchup this week against Travis Kelsey. Obviously, on the wide receiver, we're going to know the big matchup is Xavier Howard and Tyree Kill. Zay, big, or, or X as they call him, leads the league in interceptions. Tyree Kill, we know, some people may consider him the best receiver in the game. And we can't forget about Byron Jones. He'll lock up whoever else they need to lock up. They may say, hey, we need you on Travis Kelsey. You never know. It's going to be interesting to see the game plan Miami formulates against Kansas City this week. And it's going to be interesting to see how Andy Reid and Brian Flores, offensive guy and a defensive guy, clashed. Because you never know these two teams may have to play each other again this year in the playoffs. Miami obviously needs this game a lot just to keep their footing in the wild card as they're currently in there right now. To keep further, further establishing themselves as a wild card team. The Chiefs are just doing this now that Pittsburgh has lost to establish themselves as the number one seed. Because here's the thing. Even though they, the Pittsburgh lost, they, have, they haven't still lost to an AFC team yet. So they're the number one seed. But Kansas City wants that number one spot. And Pittsburgh does have some tough games coming up. And I think Kansas City definitely wants to go and try to handle business themselves. So I'm going to go with Kansas City in this game. But I would not be surprised if there was an upset by the Miami Dolphins. I think Tua might have one of his better games of the year. Just... Just something that I'm thinking about. But that's all the time we have here for the segment. Coming up next, I'll finish the week, the rest of my week 14 predictions. Stay tuned.
Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G- smcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Last segment. I started my week 14 predictions on all the games. This segment, I'll continue my week 14 predictions and the rest of the games. But before we get into that, just want to give a quick reminder, whatever platform you're listening to us on the GSMC football podcast, definitely appreciate it. Don't forget to leave a review or subscribe to continue to get more of this great content here on the GSMC podcast network. But all right, let's get back into it. So next we have the Minnesota Vikings and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. A very sneaky good game this week. Tampa Bay coming off a late bye week. 7-5, and five, lost a couple of games going into it, needing a real big bounce back game. Clearly, probably will not win a division. And Tom Brady hasn't played well. So now they're looking to try to get back into things, get back into the flow of things this week. Now, Minnesota, outside of that, that cowboy blemish, have now gotten themselves back into the playoff race firmly, tied with Arizona for that last spot. So they're in a position where they have made a dramatic change after starting the season off the way they did. Dalvin Cook has been Calvin Cook. Kirk Cousins has played very well. You know, Van Jefferson, Justin Jefferson, my bad. Justin Jefferson has played absolutely fantastic. A godsend. You know, trading stuff on digs, people thought may have really cost them. But they did it because they didn't want to pay him. And that's okay. It really, as much as we sometimes criticize teams, that's okay as long as you have a plan to replace him. And they had a plan. They had a receiver they liked. They got him, and now he's just as productive. You still got Adam Thielen. Defense is playing better. Now, obviously not the Minnesota defense from the past few years, but Mike Zimmer's defensive guy. He was going to get that defensive right eventually. And now this is a matchup where it could go either way. Now, I am surprised that they're giving Tampa Bay 6.5 points in this game. I would have expected this maybe be a little five, but they're clearly confident that Tampa Bay is going to come out, out coming off a bye with Bruce Arians and think they're going to come out here and wipe the floor with, with Minnesota. But I would not be surprised if this game is close. And honestly, I'm going to be bold and I'm going to go take the upset. I think Minnesota is going to win this ball game. And Tampa Bay will continue to fall. And everybody's going to be like, what is going on? Tampa Bay's falling apart. So I'm going to go take Minnesota Vikings to continue their success. They were getting to Colts and Raiders. The Raiders have not been playing their best football of late. Being blown out by the Falcons. 40 to 9. And then, yes, they won. But against the winless Jets, had to win on a Hail Mary just because Greg Williams decided to send one of the dumbest blitzes in NFL history. If they didn't, they probably would have stopped the Hail Mary. More than likely. And they would have gotten the first win. And then everybody would be like, what's going on? Las Vegas just got blown out. And then they lost to the lowly Jets. Colts, they bounced back after their, their loss to Tennessee. You know, Tennessee, the Colts are a team that they may have a bad performance here and there. But they bounced back. They're still a good team. So in this game, the three-point favorites, I, I would take that three. I think the Colts are going to win the game because I just, to me, the Raiders have not been playing good football. Josh Jacobs is hurt as well. We don't even know if he's going to play this week. It looks unlikely right now, but we don't know. And I just think the Colts, they're going to do what they've been doing. They're going to run it with their three boarding back, Jonathan Taylor, Nick Hines, and them. They're going to go out there. Phil Rivers is going to make some key timely throws, and I think there's going to be enough to win. And I think their defense is going to, 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 to definitely be an interesting matchup against the receivers. Because the one thing that they can say came out of the Jets game from last week is that Derek Carr had a big game. 
It wasn't Derek Carr that was why they lost that game. They just didn't have much of a running game. So we'll have to see if they don't have Josh Jacobs again this week, how they respond, how they are in this week's game. But I think I'm going with the Colts to win. Then you have the 0-12 Jets going up to Seattle to face Seattle. And let's be honest here. I think this is going to be a wash. I think Seattle coming off the game they came off of, they're going to be looking to really bounce back this week. Good teams, to me, bounce back from games like that. Especially, it does help that you're playing a Jets team that has played better. But I don't think they're going to be able to take advantage of the Seattle Seahawks offensive line like the Giants were. And I think that DK, this could be a this could be a big DK Metcalf game. To me, this could be a very big DK Metcalf game. Clearly, we know Seattle hopefully running backs to get a running game established. I think the Jets, this Jets game is a good game for them to try to establish what they want to be. To establish what they're trying to be and to get them where they're where they're comfortable to me. I think that's what they're gonna to try to aim for, that's what they're gonna to try to do. So I think that overall, they should be in a good place and they should be good to go. As they should. I mean, listen, they're, they're a team, like I said, you know, Jets coming in here, they're 13.5 underdogs for a rate for, for a reason. Offensively, they're a mess. Defensively, they're a mess. Now we don't even know how the defense is going to look with a new defensive coordinator. I don't think Seattle is going to have two shockers in a row. But definitely, definitely, definitely think that Seattle is going to come out with a win here. And be able to, you know, just continue to uh, do what they got to do. Because, plus, I mean, they got to win this game. You know, right now, they're not even winning the division right now. The, the, the Rams are. So, they know they need this game. They can't afford to have any type of blemishes. So, you know. But, on the next game. We got the Green Bay Packers and the Detroit Lions. Now, as much as it's crazy to say this, Detroit is still only a game out of the the fifth. Wait, hold up. I want to be accurate with this. Detroit is a game out of the of the last wild card spot in the NFC. So this game has meaning for Detroit, and then some good news for them. DeAndre Swift should be back this week. And it looks like we're not sure what 100%. Maybe it doesn't look like it. Kenny Galladay has a small chance. But more than not, DeAndre Swift will be back this week. And we know he can make some things happen. He was heating up before he got hurt. So he should he should be back this week. If there's one thing Green Bay is susceptible to is the running game. They can be ran on. So this could be a big DeAndre Swift game, potentially. But we know Green Bay, with that offense, with Aaron Rodgers and, and, and Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones, they they have they should be able to handle Detroit. Remember, last year they had two close games with Detroit. Very, very close games with Detroit. This year, they played them week two, 142-21. to 21. Detroit without Matt Patricia, maybe you never know. Teams sometimes play better with different head coaches. So this would probably be my sneaky upset game of the week to me because I think Detroit, you know, knowing that they're still in playoff position, knowing they have still something to play for so late in the year, getting one of their best players back, to me, you got to, and knowing how Green Bay could have those stinkers or sometimes not play the best, to me, it just makes me say, we got to keep an eye on this game. Because if they're able to pull it off, Detroit now could be sitting in a wild card spot. Or a tie for a wild card spot. So, just something to keep an eye on, but I am going with the Packers. We got Saints and Eagles. The Jalen Hurts game. You know, Jalen Hurts is coming into this game. We don't know how he's going to play. The Saints have played excellent without Drew Brees. Defensively, still been basically one of the best defenses in the league. Taysom Hill has played well enough to win. Alvin Kamara has played well enough as well. They're 6.5 favorites in this game. 6.5 point favorites. And 
I'd be if I if I'm if I'm any betting man, I'm I'm gonna take the Saints in this. Like I'm gonna take the Saints, but it's gonna be interesting to see Jalen Hurts in this game. To see how he plays, because if he plays well, you might have to consider him to be the new starting quarterback of the Eagles potentially, even with paying once all that money. So just that that will be a very interesting storyline to look at to the game, is how that goes. Then we have Falcons and Chargers. You know the Falcons season relatively basically just ended because of that loss to the Saints. Because if they had won, they would have been a game out of the, what, uh, the seventh spot. But now they. They're not really playing for anything. So now how is this team going to come out and play? Clearly the fan would want the Falcons to lose. Listen, LA is playing for some. And that's Anthony Lynn right now. Now, Chargers management has already came out and said we will not say or evaluate or give any decisions till the end of the year. We will evaluate everything because we have tremendous respect for him. But he has to start picking up some wins and get the team to play better if he wants to still be the head coach next year. So I'm going to go with the Chargers to win this game just because I feel like they have more to play for right now. But I still expect the Falcons to play the way they can because their defense has played very well. I just think this may be a game that Chargers need, so I'm going to go and say they're going to be desperate if they really want Anthony Lynn and they're going to win. And then we have Washington and the San Francisco 49ers. I'm going to go with Washington. I think Washington, they have a way. They're going to run the football, play good defense, and Alex Smith is going to make enough plays. That's basically their formula. That's basically any Alex Smith team. Except this is probably not one of the more talented teams to do it. But they're good enough to do it. I think San Francisco's in the same light. Honestly, it depends on Nick Mullins and his performance. But I think they'll be fine. And I think Washington's going to get the game. Then we got Steelers and Buffalo on Sunday night football. Buffalo is a two and a half point favorite in this game. Now for me, I think that... Pittsburgh's coming off a game where... The holes and the and, and, and the issues with Pittsburgh that we've seen all year long were finally exposed. And so now we have to see how they respond after taking their first life loss on a short week against a very hot Buffalo team again. Josh Allen playing some of his best football because we saw what he did to San Francisco on Monday Night Football, which is still a good defense. Pittsburgh's having injuries pile up on their end on defense. So you might see Buffalo, to me, pick up the W. And that's when we'll go with. I think Buffalo's going to continue it. Pittsburgh is going to lose two straight. And then lastly, Ravens and Browns on Monday Night Football. Who would have ever thought at this point in the season Cleveland would be ahead of the Ravens? Ravens are fighting just to get into the playoffs right now, where the Cleveland is firmly in the playoffs right now. Not winning the division or anything, even though if Pittsburgh does lose, it does now open up an opportunity for Cleveland to win the division because they still got to play Pittsburgh. But definitely to me in this game, people say, are the Ravens back after being the Cowboys? I'm not sure about that just because they did play the Dallas Cowboys. And and when and this game to me is going to tell me if they're truly back. And I think this is also another game for Baker Mayfield to show people what you saw. It was not a fluke against Tennessee. That 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 is what I'm going to become. And if he's that way, I think Cleveland's going to pick up the victory here. And those are my Week 14 predictions right there for this latest slate of NFL games. Coming up next, we're going to get into the biggest college games of the week. And also some NFL news. So stay tuned. 
Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment, I finished up my Week 14 predictions. Talking about everything, or every game, who I thought was going to win, who I thought was going to lose. So that's what we discussed last segment. Now you know we do this segment. Get into the biggest college game, in my opinion, of the week. And then talk about some NFL news or any other extensional college news if there is something to be talked about. But before we do that, I'll give one more reminder to you guys to follow us on Twitter. At GSMC underscore basketball. That is Twitter at GSMC underscore basketball. So let's get into it. First big game of the week. Just because it's a top 25 matchup. It's the Dogs of Georgia versus the Tigers of Missouri. Missouri just cracked 25 in the latest uh you know, ranking. So can be can be an impressive win for Georgia. Offense has looked better with JT Daniels behind center. Looking to continue his growth, to continue his growth as Georgia continues to try to get maybe into a top bowl game. Missouri has played better, which is the reason why they're here. But if you look at the game, I'm sure Georgia's a 13-point favorite for a reason. And I expect them to be able to come out with a victory. 12 o'clock. And go to 7-2 on the year. And then, we have Oklahoma and West Virginia. This is big in terms of potential Big 12 championship race standings. If they win this game, I believe this clinches them a, a spot in the Big 12 championship game. So it's very important for them to win. Oklahoma has played much better football ever since starting off the season one and two. If this was a normal year, would they maybe have more of a case to potentially try to make it into the playoff? Where you know with the two losses and them not playing all the games makes it a very uphill climb. But West Virginia is a team that you have to take seriously, a team that can play, and so uh, but I do expect Oklahoma and Rattler to come out on top as 14-point favorites and win the game. Then we have Coastal Carolina and Troy. The only reason I'm talking about this game is to give love to Coastal Carolina. Big victory last week over BYU. Didn't really move them up as much as they thought. Obviously, you know the committee. They looked at BYU as not that good. I mean, it was a good win, but it wasn't a win that Overly impressed them because of course Carolina has the same issues as BYU have have not really had a good schedule even though they've technically beaten two AP twenty five teams. Uh, look at the goal eleven no, which is close to Carolina. Maybe potentially if there's a chance to get a another ranked team on the schedule, that is something they would try to maybe try to visit, try to improve their schedule, and see if they can make that one last game push to maybe get into the conversation. But obviously also to try to get that top tier bowl game for a group of five school as well. So if that's if that's something that also is a motivation for them to play for. But I think they'll beat Troy this week. Handily. Then we got North Carolina, number seventeen North Carolina, and number ten Miami. Outside of Miami's uh blemish to Clemson, they've pretty much played well both of the year. Derrick Carolina was a team that people had high expectations for, but lost three games this year. 
they played more than Miami as they played ten. Miami only played nine, but you know was not able to reach the same expectations or the same level of success, and so that contributes to why they are where they are. I expect this to be a really good game though. I think Miami is going to win the game. It's going to be close though. And this is also good. This also can help be a, an impressive victory for Miami to have a team like North Carolina. Obviously, they probably would have hoped North Carolina was a better team coming up to this point. But this could be an impressive win for them and definitely put them in a good spot to just remain successful. Then we have LSU Florida. This is a big game to me because of the fact that if Florida wins this game, which they've already clinched the SEC championship game, they just need this game to for playoff purposes. Because next week, if they beat Alabama and, and they take care of LSU this week, I think everybody and they and they and they mama know you got to put Florida in there because they beat Alabama. I guess it'll create some interesting questions at the top. With Alabama being a one-loss team, Florida being a one-loss team. Let's say Texas A&M finishes as a one-loss team. Notre Dame, if they lose to Clemson, they're a one-loss team, and they've beaten Clemson already. It'll be interesting out of those five teams who the committee will say is the top four. I've always stated that I feel like they're going to keep Alabama in there. They're going to have to put Florida in there just because they beat Alabama. And the question, and I, and I feel like if Ohio State stays undefeated. They're going to put Ohio State in there. So now your question is Texas A&M, Notre Dame. Which one of those two schools are you going to also allow into the top? Because you already got Clemson. You already got Alabama. And you already got Ohio State. Like I said, I think Florida's going to get in there. And like I said, they're going to have to justify keeping Notre Dame out or Texas A&M out. So, I think Florida's going to take care of business this week and be able to do what they got to do. And the, and then I'll talk about the USC game, UCLA, obviously just a big rivalry within the California area. USC, the only undefeated Pac-12 team, they've been very much affected by starting late. That's why none of their teams have a chance to make the playoffs, even though they're undefeated. Um, 4-0, I expect them to go 5-0 this week. Like I said, big rivalry game. The Joe C rivalry games next couple of weeks. And I expect to come out with a victory. Play well. And do what they gotta do. So I expect everything to work out. And do what they gotta do. And those are your biggest college games of the week. Now we're gonna switch over back over to NFL. And we're going to talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers because they lost, as I said earlier, with Washington. Holes have been there. They dropped too many passes. They they they, they dropped so many passes in that game against Washington. I watched it. They don't have much of a running game, and like I said. On defense, a lot of injuries are starting to pile up. A lot of injuries are starting to really become a big issue for the Steelers. And so, the question is now, where will we put the Steelers? How good are they really? That's going to be the question. Are they one of the best teams? Are they not one of the best teams? All of it is a question. I think they still have the capability of being a Super Bowl contender. I think a game like this is important because them losing could benefit them in many different ways because of now they can get the pressure off of them of trying to remain undefeated. They can now refocus. And now say, well, instead of feeling like you got to be perfect to stay undefeated, 
Just play Steeler football. Play the way we know how to play. And everything will work itself out. I think that's where they are with it. And as they should be. So I think they're in a good place. I don't think we need to panic or anything. And I think that Steelers are going to be fine moving forward. Regardless of how the regular season finishes. And I also want to talk about the Dallas Cowboys because I just want to say this. If I'm Jerry Jones, if you lose out for the rest of this year, I think that you have to consider blowing it up, changing the coaching staff again. How can you convince yourself and convince everybody, your fans, that we can bring back the exact same coaching staff with these exact same players and next year will be a better year? Because that's the thing. They, they've paid a lot of guys big money, so you don't see them moving. Like I said, we'll, we don't know when Zach Dak's going to be back. It's almost just a question of like, well, what, what, what is this team gonna look like next year with Mike McCarthy? That's going to be the big question. So if I'm Jerry Jones, I have to seriously, seriously consider moving off of Mike McCarthy and his coaching staff. Maybe he might do a thing where he says, listen, Mike, I want to keep you, but you got to make changes to the staff and try that route. But I also just feel like this: these players don't believe in this coaching staff. They don't believe in Mike McCarthy. And I think when you have that, and knowing that a lot of these same guys are probably going to be there unless they make whole scale changes to their roster, I just don't see Dallas being able to turn around next year either, even with Dak coming back. Unless they use the assets they have and try to do something with that to help create or or help solve the issues that they do have on the team. Uh, But I think I'm in the podcast a little bit early today. Thank you for listening to the GSMC football podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to listen to our other amazing podcast here, the GSMC podcast network. It is your host, Bryce Lewis saying, Have a good day. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program